I'm happy to welcome you to the penultimate section of our gathering today, Image as Location. I'm Greg Niemeyer, and uh, we're welcoming Great students from the uh, rhetoric department at UC Berkeley for this last part of the conference, uh, before the reception, of course. So hence, it's the penultimate, not the really last part. And uh, it's my a great honor to introduce a dear colleague uh, who um, is in uh, film and media at UC Berkeley and who uh, is also a member of the Berkeley Center for New Media's Executive Committee. Her name is Kristen Whistle. She's a professor and chair of the Department of Film and Media. Her most recent book is titled Spectacular Digital Effects, CGI and Contemporary Cinema. Uh, published by Duke uh, University Press. The paper she will present today is from a new project on 3D images that is titled Gravity, Digital 3D and the Orbital Location. So that will take us from the space of the city that Jerome Delorme so beautifully presented and uh, beautifully characterized as a place where the black box of media becomes civic again. Uh, we are now uh, looking at a, a context in which the black box of space becomes emotional again. Thank you so much for joining us, Kristen. Let's welcome Kristen Whistle. Um, thanks so much to Greg um, and to Laura for organizing this conference. Um, so I'm talking about Gravity 3D, but of course I can only show you 2D images. Um, so for many of the shots, um, I'll be describing the 3D effects. Um, so you're really going to have to take my word for it, but hopefully you can get some sense um, of what these images look like. Recent scholarship on satellite technologies defines orbital space as the location of technologically enhanced disembodied perception that extends human vision far beyond its embodied capacities. Populated by space stations and telescopes, as well as spy, GPS and communication satellites, the orbital path around Earth is, as Beth Kessler argues, a frontier space of scientific exploration that enables complex digital technologies to harvest visualizable data of distant phenomenon, which, when rendered as awe-inspiring sublime images, test the limits of, as well as the boundaries between, perception, representation, and knowledge. At the same time, the orbital location is the site of failed vision and catastrophic technological breakdown, and as such has expanded the imagination of disaster. As Lisa Parks argues, in addition to being the setting for detached and rationalized forms of observation, the orbital location is also a site of potential alienation that can, quote, catalyze desires for proximity, intelligibility, and connection, end quote. Because this space enables enhanced forms of epistemic and affective seeing, it's the ideal location for demonstrating the ex expanded capabilities of digital 3D. It makes sense then that Gravity 3D uses CGI and digital 3D's plastic parallax effects to simulate the orbital location and to dramatize the limits of vision, legibility, and knowability in a location <coughs> where technologically unmediated life and perception is impossible. In the process, the depicted orbital space reveals much about the origins and recent rise of digital 3D. Comprised mostly of CGI, keyframe animation, and digital composites, Gravity 3D creates a strikingly photoreal, yet decidedly post-photographic moving images of the orbital location, thereby participating in cinema's ongoing deployment of analog and digital technologies to satisfy the desire to see and know locations that lie beyond the scope of human vision. Gravity's generic hybridity as a science fiction melodrama allows it to mobilize a broad range of meanings that accrue to the term orbit. In the process, linking this location to affective and epistemic seeing. In addition to the astronomical sense of the elliptical course of an object or celestial body around the Earth to which it's bound by gravity, the film also activates the anatomical and poetic uses of orbit, which refer to the eye socket and the eye respectively, as well as the term's vernacular and figural uses while in orbit identifies a fixed course or path. The sphere of activity within which a person or thing normally moves or operates, going into orbit implies a heightened state of affect or emotion, as well as performance or activity. Gravity 3D's technological imaginary activates each of these meanings, linking the orbital location not only to enhanced vision and heightened emotion, 
key themes for science fiction and melodrama respectively, but also to the experience of gravity's attenuation in orbit and the desire for attachment and connectivity it provokes. In its opening shot, a fluid 13 minute long take, gravity simulates the experience of zero gravity by aligning its spectator with a floating, ubiquitous point of view. As the space shuttle, docked to the HST, glides along its orbital path into view, the camera is suddenly mobilized and follows the astronaut Kowalski as he orbits Explorer with his jetpack, thereby exemplifying what Thomas Elsesser describes as digital 3D's tendency to, quote, do away with horizons, suspend vanishing points, seamlessly vary distance, unchain the camera, and transport the observer, end quote. This shot and Elsesser's depiction of digital 3D aesthetics are 21st century variations on 19th century responses to the visual pleasures of stereoscopic views. In 1864, Oliver Wendell Holmes described stereoscopic images as producing, quote, a dreamlike exaltation of the faculties, a kind of clairvoyance, in which we seem to leave the body behind us and sail away into one strange scene after another, like disembodied spirits, end quote. The floating ubiquity produced by gravity updates and enhances the sense of sailing away, not only by taking the spectator from one orbital location to another, but also by mobilizing the camera fluidly through expanded volumetric space, a feat made possible by digital tools that, Stephen Prince notes, allows effects artists to, quote, treat parallax and interaxial values as fine-grained and flexible units of expression, end quote. Moreover, the film enhances the sensation of disembodied floating ubiquity by eliminating vanishing points and a grounded and centered monocular point of view, and at strategic moments, undermining the conventions of continuity editing used to orient the spectator in gravity-bound filmic space. For example, here digital camera moves combined with Earth's rotation and Kowalski's shifting position in off-screen space to undermine the conventional optical cues used to anchor the cameras in the spectator's point of view. Throughout, such shots are combined with 3D's tendency to provoke what Jonathan Crary calls a, quote, vertiginous uncertainty about the distance separating forms, end quote, to simulate the groundlessness of the orbital location and to immerse the spectator in a vastly expanded optical field. And we don't really expect him to appear on this side of the frame. The use of digital multi-channel sound to create three -dimensional, a three-dimensional sonic field to match this volumetric space is important. The soundtrack audibly links the spectator to the astronauts in Houston by patching us into their communications, enhancing the film's immersive aesthetic while foregrounding the fact that any perceptual experience of or in orbit is by definition technologically mediated. That is to say, the film equates immersion within orbital space to sensory immersion within a technological field. Hence, in its first 15 minutes, the dialogue we overhear through a simulated com link, comms link references spy and global pol positioning satellites, communication satellites and the social media they enable, medical technologies, the HST and ISS, amongst others, defining the orbital location as a commodified site of mass communication, scientific exploration, state surveillance, military power, and geopolitical conflict. Gravity 3D makes clear that such technologies and the desires and objectives they imply are the conditions of possibility for human life in space. The film defines the ideal perceptual experience of the orbital location as a technologically mediated, floating and detached point of view that is nevertheless visibly and audibly connected to Earth by material, metaphorical, and technological tethers. We aren't given access to this idealized perceptual experience for very long. At the end of the film's opening sequence, debris from a destroyed spy satellite rips through the shuttle's orbital path, cutting communications with Earth, disabling or destroying other orbital technologies, and sending the astronauts hurtling into space. Gravity's simulation of the orbital location following catastrophic technological breakdown depends in part on the way it puts 3D's floating point of view into conflict with what scholars call the virtual tangibility 
of the 3D image and its promotion of a haptic look. These result from 3D's resolution of two slightly different views of an object into a single image, which endows depicted objects with illusory solidity and enhanced tangibility, especially when they occupy the foreground. Holmes described this effect as follows, quote, the mind, as it were, feels round the object and gets an idea of its solidity. We clasp an object with our eyes, as with our arms or with our hands or our thumb and finger, and then we know it to be something more than a surface, end quote. Gravity 3D intensifies by thematizing this haptic look, which Crary describes as, quote, tangibility that has been transformed into a purely visual experience. Following the first orbital pass of satellite debris, the protagonists struggle to reach and attach themselves and e to each other and to the remaining orbital technology, thereby intensifying 3D's haptic look. In one scene, Stone propels herself toward the space station and desperately tries to affix herself to it, grasping at smooth surfaces and floating just beyond the reach of handles and protrusions, prompting the in the spectator a haptic look that rakes across the image for anything it too might grasp. Here, the film places the virtual tangibility of the 3D image in conflict with the previously idealized floating gaze, such that each intensifies the effects and the desires associated with the other in order to produce a kinesthetic experience of orbital space. And if you're watching this in like IMAX 3D, it's very hard not to lean in the direction that you want her to go in while watching the film. These stereoscopic modes of perception are integrated into gravity's spatialized narrative such that the virtual tangibility of the image and the desire for connection are aligned with emergence and affective seeing while floating is aligned with depth and epistemic seeing. Rather than oppose these, however, as they often are in film theory, the film joins them together to address problems and fantasies around questions of knowability and legibility, both of which drive any orbital endeavor, whether the goal is something like terrestrial surveillance or the search for new planets in outer space. Gravity 3D opens by aligning epistemic seeing with positive parallax as explorer appears from the depths of space first seen only as a tiny white dot in the distance as Stone's communications with NASA become audible, transforming the orbital void into a zone of inquiry that establishes the limits of the knowable and links the latter to phenomenon located millions of light years from Earth. It extends the association between epistemic seeing and depth effects later when Kowalski untethers himself from Stone and as he drifts off into deep space, becomes the voice of knowledge as he provides Stone with information key to her survival. <coughs> so there he is. So the farther away he drifts off into space, the more omniscient he becomes. His final words, which, which express astonishment at the sight of sunlight on the Ganges, link epistemic seeing to depth and the pleasures of the technologically mediated sublime view, even as he disappears into depths that make him ultimately illegible and eventually unknowable. And so far as gravity exploits digital 3D to register problems with legibility and knowability, it functions like the scanner that the crew attaches to the HST. Initially invented by Stone for hospital and medical uses, it will serve as, quote, a new pair of eyes to see the edges of the universe, end quote, once it's installed on Hubble. 3D works similarly in gravity not only to produce the orbital location as a vast volumetric space, but also to externalize and render visible internal states that are otherwise inaccessible to vision. In one of the most interesting shots in the film, 
3D is used to frame psychological interiority as that which challenges or functions as the limit of cinematic representation and legibility. As the astronauts drift towards ISS, Kowalski asks Stone if anyone on Earth is looking up at her, and she whispers, I had a daughter, prompting him to look at her in the mirror that's strapped to his wrist, and she's been floating behind him, tethered to him. The shot deranges depth cues and gives a planar quality to the image that frames the film's other gravity-related catastrophe. And we find out that her daughter uh, was playing tag and fell and hit her head while at school. Um, as a challenge to representation, legibility, and knowability, the framing and containment created by the mirror, the spacesuit, and the reflective surface of the visor create an image of radical isolation. In turn, the mirror reflects and foregrounds an image in depth creating a disorienting contrast between the vast depths of space visible behind the more flattened, but nevertheless 3D image in the mirror. So if you're seeing this in 3D, it's really sort of deep space behind um, the gloved hand. And then the mirrored image is also in depth, but at a much sort of shall shallower stereo value. These variable depth cues place Stone at a further remove th from her than her actual location in space, Framing her as self-contained, remote, and illegible, a distant satellite isolated and obscured by grief. She narrates the basic, basic facts of her daughter, daughter's death in a detached and affectless manner as Earth is reflected against her visor, an image that frames her mission as a flight from gravity and an intentional alienation from Earth. Gravity 3D dramatizes illegibility by exploiting negative parallax in its efforts to articulate the orbital as movement around Earth, as heightened affect, and as the eye. As Stone inertly orbits Earth in a disabled Soyuz, she realizes that death is imminent and begins to cry. A tear escapes her eye, emerging from one orbit into another, and floats into the space of the theater. thereby escaping containment by the body and the screen. And the tear actually, um, in 3D, sort of comes out and hovers um, in the space of the theater before moving downward and out of the frame. The tear reflects um, an inverted image of Stone's face on its surface, creating the affective image of a character engulfed by loss and grief. In place of a conventional melodramatic close-up of the heroine's tear-streaked face, and this is sort of Hollywood's favorite representation um, of sadness, negative parallax brings a face-streaked tear into the space of the cinema, promising a transcendent, tangible connection between spectator and image across spatial and temporal divides. Its emergence from the screen provokes the desire to touch the affective image to confirm its presence, and with it, the sense that the film's orbital location is coterminous with the space of the cinema. And while the digital tear draws the spectator toward the screen, its intangibility and ephemerality ultimately express and intensify the desire for unmediated connection and reunion between the space of representation and reception, between astronaut and Earth, between performer and spectator. To address this desire, gravity stages a phantasmatic reunion. Stone turns off the oxygen in the Soyuz and drifts off to sleep. And moments later, Kowalski sort of knocks on the window. He reappears from the depths um, of space and from the depths of Stone's unconscious. Um, as an emergent hallucination that enters the capsule, um, st his legs stretching into the space of the theater. <coughs> Extending the link between knowledge and depth, affect and emergence, Kowalski appears in order to tell Stone what she already knows, how to get the Soyuz to the Chinese station, and how to sever herself from the grief that binds her fatally to the past. Through this hallucinatory image, Gravity 3D arranges epistemic and affective seeing along a continuum that follows the z-axis from the extreme depths of the image across the screen and into the space of the theater. And the process foregrounding the idea that epistemic seeing is often inseparable from affect and that the images produced of and from the desire to see and know often function as repositories of emotion. Gravity's orbital location functions something like a time machine, then, that allows us to see digital 3D's past in order to better understand the present. Whereas many scholars compare the latest uh, generation of 3D cinema to its celluloid past, 
gravity's floating satellites, space station, and CG tiers suggest an alternative history through which to approach the resurgence of stereoscopic, stereoscopic cinema as digital media. Gravity's floating tier refers us to the first stereographs. These were not photographs, but line drawings of geometric shapes floating in space used by Charles Wheatstone to demonstrate the principles of binocular vision on which his stereoscope was based. The origins of digital 3D's floating objects lie, in part, in a graphic tradition that runs from Wheatstone's line drawings through animated film to CGI. It's important to keep this in mind when discussing the floating subjects and objects that populate gravity's orbital location. Elsasser rightly connects digital 3D's gravitylessness to our broader historical context and the subject position it produces, and argues that digital 3D's inauguration of an illusory, ubiquitous floating presence corresponds to and compensates for compensates one for being, quote, a mere speck in the universe, enmeshed in networks of plotted coordinates, trackable and traceable at every point in space or time, end quote. Of course, the suspense derived from Gravity 3D's free-floating subjects has something to do with the fantasy of this network's collapse, which transforms the orbital location into a void far beyond any functioning network and the subsequent desire to relocate oneself within it. I would also add that digital 3D's ephemeral floating objects are related to the desire to collapse the distance between self and representation, evidenced in a range of digital media that allow a projection of self into media space, from video game avatars to social media such as Instagram. The Soviet filmmaker Sergei Eisenstein argued that 3D's emergence effects must be read as an attempt to bridge or compensate for the widening gap, the widening gap between production and consumption that is the hallmark of capitalism. While the digital tier's transcendence of the screen addresses this desire, its ephemerality and immateriality and its status as the repository of affect identify it as a perfect media commodity. Along with the numerous orbital technologies gravity references, this CG emergent tier and Gravity 3D's box office ultimately designate the orbital location as a privileged site for late capital. Thank you. Amazing, it was 20 minutes and zero seconds. I, <laughs> I, got, such a, I got such a warning. That All right, may, may we walk you over to the yeah. questioning uh, zone. Uh, you keep it for the questions okay. and then uh, pass it on later. So, I don't know. Yes, any questions for Kristen, please? This is the moment. Monica. Monica, go ahead. That was great. That totally changed. Your talk totally made it seem like in a completely different way. Um, that was great. What I'm curious about, though, is if it's Intentionality is always a really like complex and vexed <laughs> kind of issue. I, I doubt it, and I'm not sure that it matters. Um, but I think that the I, I would say that there's this whole tradition of like picturing space, um, outer space, that you know informs their particular depiction of outer space, and there are ways that it really kind of departs from that, and that's as a result of um, the story they're trying to tell on the one hand, but. Um, also the kind of tools that they have um, to tell the story. And, um, you know, I mean, most science fiction films are films in space, there, there's gravity. I mean, people are sort of walking around spaceships and, um, and it, it's not, you know, they're not here. And so, um, but I think the, you know, the film is titled Gravity. And, um, you know, I think the fact that it's a science fiction melodrama, um, kind of transforms the way that that space is then used. Um, just, you know, gravity refers to, the, you know, it keeps that debris going around, whipping around, with, you know, every 90 minutes. So it sort of sets that clock that makes it a very suspenseful film. But then there's the gravity of the situation. Gravity is derived from grief, or grief is related to gravity. So there's the grief, uh, you know, that she's feeling that makes her so kind of um, unreadable in the first half of the film. 
Um, the gravity, that her daughter's death is gravity related. It's this minor sort of catastrophe. And so I think there are a lot of themes in the script. Um, you know, the whole thing about failed vision. If you think about all of this really kind of throwaway dialogue, it's all about failing to see. Um, so the stories that Kowalski tells are all about he thought his wife was looking up at him, but instead she's, you know, and he's looking down at her, but he's left, you know, she's left with another man. And then she misre he misrecognizes a woman whom he thought he was interested in, and she's a lesbian. And, you know, he's just about to, you know, sort of say, like, you know, she's with a guy, or with a woman, not a guy. Um, there's a joke about them not knowing the color of their eyes either. Um, you know, they keep saying, I have blue eyes, no, you have brown eyes. Um, and then Houston and the blind. And so a lot of the dialogue seems so kind of superficial and throwaway. Um, but, you know, in that first 10 minutes, like all of this kind of throwaway, incidental kind of dialogue references all of these technologies in a really kind of clear way. Um, and it's a way of kind of defining that space and, and filling it out um, that's easy to overlook. That was a long answer, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. There's two more questions over there in the middle and then over there. And uh, I wonder if Emmanuel is still, where is Emmanuel? Oh, there you are. So a topic image, right? Um, but this actually makes a place that we normally can't go to. So I was wondering if there was any tension there or not. Um, but uh, it's not my question time. Okay. So I'm just thinking about it. Go ahead. So I, I have sort of a similar question, but rather than addressing intention, I'd like to inquire about um, influence. Um, and so from my understanding, um, this film was created through a collaboration with a company called Bot and Dolly. Mm -hmm. um, in San Francisco. Yeah, 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 so you're familiar. Um, so they have, they brought these, you know, big robotic arms and strap mm -hmm. cameras to them and sort of created the ability to create sort of unprecedented shots um, that weren't, that aren't normally, um, are, you can't normally get. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm just curious if you thought this sort of enhanced exploration of the orbital location was influenced more by that, the form of that technology that they were working with or mm -hmm. by the vision of the filmmakers, um, that th the vision of the filmmakers had for, for um, exploration? I think they feed into one another. Um, so I mean, Bot and Dolly came in after this, you know, the script had been written and I think some of the previous had been done as well. Um, so, um, I mean, they definitely solved a problem. I mean, they, they went to some other sort of tech conference and saw um, a, a presentation by Bot and Dolly on so, some kind of um, sort of robot stuff that they were doing um, and then asked them to design something. Um, and the, what they did des end up designing was it wasn't just the cameras, but it also allowed them to create a 360 degree LED display that would give them a kind of accurate sense of how, say when she's spinning in space, how the light reflected from Earth by the sun would, would appear on her visor and um, it was really helpful for, for conceiving the light design for the film. And so I think, you know, I mean, sometimes technologies solve problems, sometimes limits actually, you know, if, if no technology is there to give you what you need, sometimes those limit, limits actually sort of force people to be creative in other ways. So um, I, I think it goes in both directions. We have a question over there and one here, um, but the microphone's there right now, so let's do this one and then that one and then we're done. Yeah. Where? Yeah. No, it's. Oh. It's not a it's not a question. It's just a comment because you um, you brought me in. But um, I found it surprising uh, how little this movie is about space and how much it is about the planet Earth. Mm -hmm. uh, it's always in the in the image, right? Almost always. Exactly. Yeah. So so uh, even the the movie's title is it's not about it's not about being you know out of space. Right. It's, be it's about gravity. So what is gravity? That's the law. On, on the earth and so it's always in, you fly over Egypt and, and uh, India and, and, and even the last, the last scene is kind of neo-Darwinian uh, oh yeah, you yeah. know uh, reconquering the earth this time moving out of the water right. isn't that an amazing kind of embracing, embracing the earth as the only uh, abode uh, the only dwelling place 
uh, because we can't be out of space. So I would say it's not an atopic movie. It's an extremely topic or topological movie. Oh. It it and, you know, Earth is almost in every shot. Yeah. And then it was used expressi ex expressionistically. So when she's narrating about her daughter's death, it's, it's night in the background or, or at some point when something, her oxygen runs out. Um, but, um, I mean, it, it's really strange that, like, Life of Pi is another kind of digital floating, you know, where you just sort of see him. And it kind of ends, too, with him flopping down on a beach and finally, you know, sort of being on land. And, you know, again, I think it's this, there's something about connection and attachment and being sort of untethered from everything. So both of these films, you know, use this kind of floating to really alienate and isolate these characters. And they both kind of have imaginary companions who they talk to who aren't really there. Um, or hallucinations, but yet, right, so it's about alienation from Earth and that attenuation of gravity. It's a pull that's still there, um, and no matter how alienated she is, it's going out of orbit that's the most terrifying thing. So it's nostalgia for gravity. Okay, one more question. Um, your last sentence uh, put capitalism in the same sentence mm -hmm. as privilege, mm -hmm. and I'm wondering if you could elaborate a little bit on that. I'm, I, what it brought to mind was a quote from a poet can't remember who, uh, but it had something to do with the fact that it's difficult for us to experience place because more often than not, we, we um, experience the description of place. Mm -hmm. And uh, I just wonder if you're talking about privilege in relationship to those people who have technology and are able to give us those views of places that are inaccessible. Well, I think it's only accessible through um, like huge sums of, of capital. And so all of those, you know, satellites, the communication satellites, the GPS satellites, um, the military satellites, you know, it's a spy satellite that starts the whole, that turns it from just like a space mission into a drama, that transforms the location into setting, into a kind of dramatic space. Um, but, I mean, also, I mean, I think the film cost $100 million to make and then grossed about $700 million, um, globally so far. Um, so it's, you know, image as location, it, it's, it's, it's not an accessible location, I think, unless, um, and now, of course, there are these, you can pay $20 million to, you know, sign up. <laughs> Just like with NASA? Yeah. Um, I don't think that much, actually. I mean, I've only, I've only sort of, researched, um, like Cinefax gives you a really good sort of description, SIGGRAPH pr proceedings do, and then I've, I've seen whatever interviews are available. Um, I know that they couldn't actually like use the NASA logo and they couldn't, um, but I'm sure there were researchers. I mean, they did work with researchers to figure out, and sometimes they just set this aside, is this possible in terms of astrophysics? So the, the floating away was the biggest kind of cheat. He, he wouldn't have floated away. Um, yeah. All right, well, um, I need to take my computer. we are going to thank you one more time, Chris. Thanks for coming. Uh,